Good morning, everyone. I'm Lisa Bottoms, and I'm the Executive Director of NAMIC Northern Ohio Chapter. I will be your MC today. Uh, we are so excited to have you joining us for our second Level Up event. Um, I want to thank our platinum sponsors for today's session, First Energy and Key Bank. And we'd like to thank DigiZoom for hosting us today and providing our technical assistance. Today, we will define what being bankable is and why that's important. And then we'll have an esteemed panel talk to us about different strategies and products that are available uh, in order to be bankable. But before we get started, let's talk a little bit about NAMAC. Uh, NAMAC stands for the National Association of Minority Contractors. It was founded in Oakland, California uh, in 1969 by Ray Jones and Joseph Debro. And NAMAC is the oldest minority construction um, trade association in the United States. Our local NAMAC chapter, Northern Ohio, is one of 21 local chapters. Our main objective is to bring diversity and inclusion to the forefront of construction in Cleveland, Toledo, Akron, Canton, Youngstown, and Warren. NAMAC's mission is to provide access to opportunities, advocacy, and construct, construct contractor, excuse me, uh, development and training. NAMAC Northern Ohio chapter works in collaboration with our corporate, community, and public partners. Please consider joining NAMAC Northern Ohio chapter to get information on the latest construction jobs, training, and advocacy positions that impact minority businesses. Uh, we'd like to also recognize our corporate partner members, uh, Whiting Turney, Gil Bain, Metro Health, and First National Bank. We are looking for additional corporate partners as well for corporate sponsorships. So if you're interested, please feel free to contact me, Lisa Bottoms. We would love to have you join us. So now let's set the stage. NAMAX Level Up program is one of our four core programs that assist members, both union and non-union uh, industry folks with building capacity. All right, for each of our NAMAC Northern Ohio chapter uh, board member is responsible for planning our level up sessions. So today's session, Being Bankable, was created by Meltree Sharp, managing partner of Cleve Consulting Firm. Meltrice is a CPA and has more than 16 years as a certified public accountant. She has extensive knowledge and experience in the areas of accounting, tax management, and finance. Meltree serves as the treasurer of NAMAC, Northern Ohio chapter. Also joining us today is John Todd. He's the president of JWT and Associates. JWT is a construction uh, service firm specializing in construction management and general contracting, offering self-performance services, acoustical um, ceiling tile, drywall installation, and metal studs. John is also a NAMAC member. The purpose of today's event is to understand what it means to be bankable and why it's important and the strategies that minority businesses can implement. So let's get started. Welcome panelists. Well, good so afternoon. Our first uh, question is, what does the term bankable mean and why is it important for businesses? Eltrice? So the term bankable is simply means to, is, is a business credit worthy? Um, does the business, is the, is the business sufficiently healthy to service the debt? Meaning, can they pay back the principal and the interest of a loan timely based on the contractual terms of that loan? Um, unless you have uh, angel investors or uh, uh, venture capitalists waiting, knocking down your door to invest in your business, or unless you have a slush fund sitting somewhere, gaining access to capital is really critical to the success of every business. And when you think about capital, capital allows a business to grow, sustain, um, manage operations, take advantage of new opportunities when they become available. Um, and so in order for a business to be successful, capital is critical. Um, well, having said that, if you don't have access to capital or businesses that don't have access to capital, typically we see them suffering with cash flow issues um, 
And oftentimes that causes them to close their doors, which impacts their families, impacts our communities, and impacts our economy. So capital is really, really critical to every business owner. So John, tell us a little bit, uh, how were you able to become bankable? Uh, I think, you know, just for me, uh, being, becoming a bankable was just over time. You know, uh, I'm a, again, a construction firm. And when I first started out, you know, uh, our thing is just labor and materials. So you had to understand, you know, what your total cost is with labor. Uh, without that, you know, you can go and estimate a job and all of a sudden you wonder why you're in the red is because you didn't understand what your labor cost was and production. You know, materials stays the same uh, once you estimate a job. So it was very, it was very important that I became, you know, the estimator that, you know, sometimes small companies, we don't know the intricate part that, you know, we all were trying to buy out that service. So whatever service that you're trying to buy out, I believe you have to become that and get yourself educated to so that, you know, you are that estimator, you know, for construction. And so once I did that over the, uh, over the few years, you know, we had some profitable projects, credit score went up. Uh, I became, you know, bankable. I was able to walk in with good financials uh, and, and being able to show the bank, hey, uh, I can pop my collar, you know, because I got options, you know, and, and that's important. You know, uh, it's been so many times that you go into a bank and, you know, they saying not yet, not now, you know, you, you were almost there, you know. Uh, uh, so it, you know, once I got to that point, you know, everything changed. You know, uh, bigger projects. Uh, you had relationships. I already had relationships, but the relationships became a little better because I was more bankable and more uh, uh, sound as a business. All right, thank you. So, Meltrice, uh, what made you pick this theme? For our level up session. So this was a no brainer for me. I'm a numbers girl. I've been in accounting over 20 years. Um, and as a managing partner of CLE consulting firm and accounting firm right here in Cleveland, my partner and I witness firsthand frequently business owners that have great business models. Um, there's no reason why they can't become the next Fortune 100 or 500 company. The only thing prohibiting them from doing that is the lack of uh, capital or the ability to access capital. And so, you, you know, understand that uh, if you don't have, if you can't produce financial statements, which tells a compelling story about your ability to pay back uh, the loan, then you can't access capital. So um, it was really a no brainer to me. One of the things that I, I like to say is that we've been discussing social justice and racial equity a lot, but what I don't hear often enough is the discussion around economic equity. Equity. I don't hear wealth talked about enough. Who controls our wealth in our community? Who controls our wealth in our co country? Um, I think about how the haves and the, the the gap between the haves and the have-nots and the wealthy and the unwealthy is widening. And if we don't have this hard discussion and put real solutions in place so that we can bridge that gap, our community is going to, going to suffer, particular. And you know how they say, when America gets a cold, the black community gets the flu. So our community is going to suffer. Um, our country is going to suffer. And at one point, we're not gonna be competitive because that gap is so, so um, so why? And I'd like to add the Federal Reserve Bank, and I'm going to read for a second, the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, in collaboration with other branches, um, they, they do a survey each year where they survey uh, small businesses. In this particular survey, they surveyed minority businesses. Um, and they have some st alarming statistics in their report. And I'm just going to name a few of them. But one of them was Black-owned firm application rates for new funding. So that means Black-owned businesses that go and apply for funding through banks is 10% percentage points higher than that of our counterparts. However, the approval rates are 19 percentage points lower. Um, another alarming statistics, statistic is 40% of non-applicant Black-owned firms, meaning firms that just don't apply, right? indicated that they were discouraged and they didn't apply because they didn't think that they would get the loan in the first place. Um, and that's compared to 14% of our counterparts. And then lastly, 
42% of black owned firms are smaller than 100,000 in revenue as compared to our counterparts of 17%. So this conversation around money and wealth is important to me. And I honestly think it should be important to everyone. Right, right. John, tell us, how did you, what steps did you take to become bankable? <laughs> yeah. What steps did I take to become bankable? I, again, uh, I taught myself, I took a classes about uh, uh, the business that I am. And I mean, you know, again, you know, construction is about estimating, you know, uh, if you can't put the numbers out right, you, you can't, you can't survive. I mean, so, and you have to understand in any business, when you're dealing with another business owner, they somewhat respect you as in saying you're in business and so you can do this. So if you give them a low number, they somehow think you could squeeze it or make it right. But at the end of the day, those, you're going to fail with it. You know, so again, what I did, uh, uh, I used to be a tradesman myself. So I kind of understood the, the amount of time it took to do a scope of work. Um, and so, you know, you put that application together and then uh, just going to estimating classes and, mm. and, and some, some stuff trial by error, you know, right. and that trial by error, you know, you, in those given times, you hope you can make it through it. You know, because it can, it can, you know, you can go under through that time, you know. And so uh, that was just pretty much just really just understanding my business and going to take classes to understand the estimating part, you know. And uh, what, and one other thing though, what I found out with businesses too, in the construction is that a lot you got two variables. One variable is that the guy is out in the field working and he wants to start a business. That's me. So what what happens there? I don't have the management skills. Right, and that's what I okay. was getting to. With, so with second, you got the person who has the management skills uh, uh, of already with estimated because they were in the office. So they have a little leg up, you know? So what you're trying to do is catch up to understand where they're at, you know? So that's that's very important because uh, that's those, those, those folks are able probably to, with understanding the structure of business, they already have 70% of it where we're coming in with just, grind you know strong muscles is trying to do the job with 20 percent of the knowledge you know so you have to go get that knowledge to be successful yeah and and john what about your personal finances how did that play a role in being bankable y'all you know I mean when you're a small business you you know people always say start an llc start this corp start this corp whatever you start at the end of the day it's still you so uh your personal finances uh again has to be up on par but normally when you start a small business you really don't have any money so basically what you're trying to do is go hustle up some jobs make some money trying to then understand the business get an accountant so, so at the end of the year you, you show some profitability then the bank's going to tell you we need two or three years of your financials from this business to say we give you some money so uh those are the things that you just it's sweat equity in the beginning you know and uh from that uh, you know, a lot of people may give, you know, you may get money from your parents or your significant other, you know, but that's a risk. I mean, because at the end of the day, you know, somebody just have to love you to do that, you know, because you're, you're a risk, you're a risk at the end of the day. I mean, too many companies fail, or you really just don't know if a person has the heart to really be in business. There's so many people in business just because they want to have the status of saying I'm in business, but they just don't have the heart to yeah. be in business. Yeah. You know, so you have you have to look in the mirror at some point to say, who am I? What am I willing to do to get myself where I need to be? And just be honest with yourself. If you don't have it. Maybe you need to go back to work for someone or to get the knowledge, you know, or whatever it is. But uh, so that's my path. You know, it's just uh, hard sweat. I mean, I might have started out. I've been in business now. I'm 55. I just turned 56. OK, oh. <laughs> so. So, I mean, I was in the trades till I was 27 and I got, I started business when I was in, uh, at 27 uh, and I started rehab and for various, various other things. And I got into the mainstream back into uh, commercial construction about the last 15 years. And so that's interesting, John, that you should say that. How did you pivot from being, doing the personal, you know, kind of uh, residential into commercial? How, how did I do that? That was already my backbone commercial. And so just for me with the residential, I didn't see the capacity for me to grow. You know, uh, some people may do well, very well with the home remodeling, things of that nature, not knocking that. But for me, uh, it was time for me to grow because I wanted, you know, uh, bigger revenues. I mean, 
residential wasn't giving me that, you know. But I would just want to throw one thing. One thing that inspired me to do all of this is that when I was younger, I used to work with my father and uh, on the weekends and uh, probably about 12, 13 years old mm -hmm. and uh, worked with him for it. He, wouldn't, he didn't pay me once we finished up. He paid me like when he got paid, right? But worked two days, probably, you know, eight hours each day. But and so the following week, he gave me cash, probably like three hundred twenty dollars. After that, it was over. <laughs> I mean, you at 12, 13, you're getting 200, you know, 300 some dollars. And, you know, we did that for a long time. Just working on the weekends. Uh, I had an uncle also uh, was one of the biggest minority landscaping contractors. So I had people that probably steered me somewhat mind wise to say this is what I wanted to do when I got older. I wanted to have my own company. Right. I think it's really important. And we're going to talk about how NAMAC um, really is trying to build that pipeline because you, in essence, you had a pipeline, someone Correct. to show you how to, how to, how to do it and oh, then okay. how to grow it. So yeah. that exposure was key. Yeah. And then you had the experiences. Yeah. So you actually yeah. learned the trades. Yeah. 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 Okay. Meltrice, tell me what should businesses be doing now? So I think the first thing that businesses should consider is getting business credit, first of all, because as John mentioned, when you first start a business, you are the business. Your personal credit is oftentimes leveraged to determine whether or not you're credit worthy. But, you know, the first thing is um, apply for Dunn's number through uh, mm. Dunn and Bradstreet. Um, that's, you know, a nine digit code that for all intents and purposes rep, um, is it's recognized as the standard way of, you know, no, noticing who the business businesses are nationally. Nationally, um, it's a, a a rating that you get from zero to a hundred, with seventy five being excellent. So anything greater than seventy five being excellent, it's a way that your vendors, your um, your lenders and your customers can really look you up and learn more about you. And this is a number that's often used when you apply for business credit. But if you don't have that number, the first thing I would say is apply for that and start to make sure that there's reporting so that you can build that business credit. But if you, it, but in the meanwhile, in the meantime, you need to build your own personal credit. So my partner and I say this all the time when we're looking at businesses, like if you're business credit is a mess or your finances is a mess in your business, oftentimes that spills over into your personal credit. And it all, way, it all impacts your ability to gain access to capital and grow your business. Um, the second thing I would say is track your numbers. Track your numbers accurately. Um, and if you can't do this, if you don't have the skill set to do it, I say you hire someone with the skill set, hire an accountant to do it. If you can't produce an income statement, a balance sheet, or a cash flow statement at the push of a button, or be ready for that opportunity when it be, when it comes available, then you're not tracking your business uh, appropriately. And more importantly, you're not making data-driven decisions. So you have to be making data-driven decisions, but you have to track your numbers so that you can produce that. Though that uh, collective group of financial statements tells a lender a lot about your business. It tells them about the health of your business. Do you have the ability to service that debt? Because ultimately a lender is not gonna loan you money if they are not confident that they're not gonna, that you can pay that money back in on time. Um, the last thing I would say is, uh, let me, let me uh, look at my notes a little bit. Uh, oh, the last thing I would say is have an active, active and working relationship with your banker. That's really, really critical. I mean, we saw this, my partner and I saw this during the, um, the CARES Act relief funding where people were getting PPP and, and relief funding. They didn't have a banking relationship. And so what, what we saw was that in some cases, people who really didn't need the money, but had a solid banking relationship were those business owners that gained access to that capital. So, you know, start that relationship, make sure you have it, make sure it's solid because oftentimes what will happen is your banker can tell your story, your business story in a more compelling way to that underwriter in addition to your financial statements, which would be what you need in order to get that loan. So be sure to build that relationship and make sure that it's meaningful and make sure they understand your business. Make sure they understand, you know, how did you start this business? What challenges are you having? How successful the business is going? So make sure that that relationship is intact. So those are the three key things I would say that if you could do now, start those things now. 
Thank you. I think that this has been a wonderful uh, opportunity to get to know um, what are the things that we should be doing as small businesses. And this is not just for the construction industry. This is for all small businesses. This Absolutely. is universal, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, and then the importance of exposure and education, right? That's yeah. really key uh, to making sure that you can be on top of your game. And Meltrice, what if you can't afford an accountant? Because, you know, or CP, I mean, you guys are expensive. So my, my partner is going to sit on the panel and he's going to say this, I'm sure. Pay now or pay later. So uh, be what, proactive as opposed to reactive. A lot of times people think I can't afford that. We were just speaking yesterday, like as a business owner, you have to realize that you have to put smart people around you. And if not, then your business is only going to grow based on your capacity. So you need to have smart people. You need to have your accountant. You need to have your attorney. You need to have your banking relationship, your insurance relationship. You need to have an investing relationship with an investment banker. Um, my partner talked about yesterday. You also need to have a marketing plan. Like So these are things that you have to have if you're going to grow your business. Now, if you're okay with and complacent being a small business and you don't have the desire to grow then maybe do it on your own and figure it out and like John said learn by trial and error but it's not that expensive if you really have a conversation with people you'll understand that it's affordable but again pay now or pay later right, right? a lot of times we're reacting to oh my god now I have this IRS letter, letter or, oh my God, it's PPP. I really can use the money or my business is going to close. And guess what? You have no financials, you have no relationships and you can't gain access to that capital. And so um, you just have to decide, make the decision, as John mentioned, make the decision. What am I trying to do? Who am I trying to be? And what do I need to get there? And, and you know, go for it. Right. John? Yeah, as a... Uh... I mean, you either, you know, dealing with your uh, financials, either you're going to pay for it monthly or you're going to pay a big cost when you have to get your taxes done. So you go, you have to pay for it at the end of the day. Yes. You know, you got to get your taxes done unless, you know, don't get me wrong. I know small businesses don't do taxes, maybe two, three years. They like to get it, let it, <laughs> let it go. And eventually somebody comes after you at that point. Absolutely. Now, you know, because you're still alive unless you're going to die, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> but, you, but you're going to have to pay for that account somewhere, somewhere along the line. And I think it's good that you, you understand monthly where you're at. You know, in, in business, no, you, you, you can't continue just to close your eyes and say, hopefully I'll make it sometime down right. the road. you got to keep it real with yourself. You know, people do that all the time. You know, if you don't do your taxes for two years, that just really means you ain't making money. And so you need to revisit some other things. Uh, so, I mean, that happens. I yeah. mean, it's happened if you talk to a lot of big businesses, it happened all all the way across the board, but somewhere along the line, you just have to fess up with yourself. Absolutely. Also, uh, she talked about uh, banking relationships. You know, uh, I found out too, you know, the small business growing, you know, I used to talk to some of the contractors. They was like, man, you, you talking to your banker? Like, man, I go and I talk to the bank manager. I mean, <laughs> that's who got access to me. But once you start making money, it's a different room. Oh yeah, Cold it's a different room. It's a different room, they, different take you room. In, they take you into and talk about money. <laughs> well. But for, Love conversations. But that's a whole different room. Yeah. I'm just saying, that's the room you want to get to. I mean, <laughs> the room out there talking to the manager, I mean, it's fine. You get a loan, whatever it is. But the other room, they're trying to give you money. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. they're trying to give you money. I said, man, I ain't never had this conversation. <laughs> so I'm just saying, you want to continue to grow your business, get healthy with your business, mm -hmm. and you'll be amazed with doors open. Yeah. I want to add to that, Lisa, what John said. Like, People don't want to loan people. People only want to lend money to people who don't need it, right? And so just because you're borrowing money doesn't mean that you don't have any of your own. It just means that you're leveraging other people's capital in order to grow your business. So a lot of times, a lot of uh, African-Americans, particularly some of our clients, ascribe to, um, no, I don't want to borrow any money or I don't want to owe anybody. But that's the, uh, the, a bad way of thinking. Um, you cannot scale that way. And I do want to add to John's point about taxes. Um, again, really reactive. It's the, it's the end of the month, I mean, the end of the year, and I'm preparing for my taxes, or it's two years later, three years later, five years later, and I, I haven't filed taxes, and now I need to do it. So now as an accountant, we do something called a compilation. And a compilation is our attempt to look at all of your financial activity, 
through bank statements and different supporting documents and try to tell the financial story. Well, by then it's too late for us to really add value to your taxes. Um, we talk to people all the time about not just preparing taxes, but really reducing your, your, your tax liability, but increasing your after-tax wealth. Well, we can't do that if we're not really partners. We can't do that if you're looking at taxes as being very transactional. It's relational. The more I know about you as a CPA, the, 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 the frequency at which we talk about your business, the better I can prepare you for that after-tax wealth, the better I can tell you how to avoid certain you know, liabilities from a tax perspective. So that's relational, not transactional. Um, Cleveland is relational, right? So when we talk about gaining access to capital and building relationships with bankers and investors, it's about relationships. Relationships sometimes will open doors for you that a document may not open. So John, tell me how you built your relationship with your banker. Made money. <laughs> how I built my relationship. <laughs> Coming with good financials. Yeah. <laughs> it's simple that's, as that. That's it. You know, without good financials, I mean, you, everybody, you know, uh, how can I say? I mean, everybody talk to you and say, hey, and all those good things. But once you got good financials, it, again, that door, that other door opens. They, yeah. they bring you in, and all of a sudden you get this other phone call from this investment banker, this all in the same company. Yeah. They all calling you. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, we're loaning you this money, we're loaning this money, uh, whatever you need, Mr. Todd. You know, it becomes Mr. Ty. I mean, it was already Mr. But it's Mr. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Ty. You know, <laughs> but, but just being financially, just continue to grow your business, business, and being financially sound. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, that brings on uh, good relationships with your banker. Uh, at the end of the day, they'll look out for you, uh, tell you about other ways to invest your money while it's sitting here in the bank. You know how you can make money on your money while it's in the bank, and so. Those things weren't happening when you, you when you trying to get over the hurdle. Yeah. You know, that wasn't the conversation because sometimes the, you be so much in the fog, you can't even think because you're trying to create finances. You're trying to create a sound business, you know? So uh, yeah, that was the thing that happened from that point. Awesome. Did you start off with a bookkeeper and then go to an accountant or did you go straight to an accountant? Uh, I've always had somewhat of a bookkeeper. When, when I first started, I had an accountant and he just, like did it, you know, he was a small account bookkeeper. So he did my stuff monthly. So eventually we got to the point where we would do things in-house. Uh, I had an accountant that wasn't like the big CPA firm uh, uh, that would come in quarterly and, and like from what we did every month and straighten it up. Then at the end of the year, we give it to my accountant, uh, the CPA firm. And so by that time, his cost is less because we've already managed everything throughout, you know, so. Uh, so, so that's an important uh, piece. And I think Meltrice, that's what you were talking about is really having a plan, a plan of action so that it doesn't have to be as costly. Yeah, I mean, yeah, as you mentioned, there's a progression, right? You don't wanna start off as a small business with not, not a lot of activity and take on a lot of expenses, right? And so most accountant, accounting, small, especially a, a small accounting firms, you can put on a retainer, a small retainer, and then you can grow over time. So we build our scope of work. We, what we try to do at, at CLE is to make sure that we are right-sizing the solution, right? We don't want to give you way too much too fast because then we'll be more of a liability than a help to your business. So we want to right-size the solution. Maybe you only need bookkeeping. Maybe you only need to talk to us as frequently as every quarter or every six months. And as you grow, maybe that frequency increases to every other month or monthly or weekly, or, or you have access to Larissa and myself. So there are ways, there are creative ways where you can get the support you need, the professional advice and experience that you need and, you know, grow your business at the same time. I think that's really important to know because, you know, as, an, as a business owner, you're always looking at expenses. And so knowing that it's not just a cookie cutter approach, but that it's individualized yes, and it's based absolutely. on your own needs. Yep. And that's really important. Absolutely. So I hope our audience gets that. Um, we received a, a question from um, our audience. How important is a DUNS number? I would say if, if your goal is to continue to grow and scale your business, as I mentioned before, a lot of us have great business models. Um, we could easily grow to a Fortune 100 and a Fortune 500 company. It's critical 
because again, it's, it's business credit. It allows you just like your personal credit when you go to Experian or Equifax, that's all a DUNS number is for your business. So a person can look you up and see, are you credit worthy? Do you pay your bills on time? <laughs> you know, how are you treating your customers? And again, it's, a, it's important if your goal is to continue to grow and gain access to capital. Okay. Well, I appreciate this has been very educational for me. I hope it's been ev educational for our audience. Um, we're going to get ready to talk a little bit about uh, NAMAX programs uh, as we transition to our panel. Hey, thank you, guys. Thank you. All right. So <laughs> NAMAC believes in making sure that we have a pipeline into the construction industry. And so we start off with our program, Rosie's Girls. And that is in collaboration with Friendly End Settlement. And this is where we begin to educate young ladies, girls, sixth grade through eighth grade. And they learn about the building trades and welding. And they actually are able to do different kinds of construction. Uh, Friendly End is a certified Rosie Girls site. Uh, and we are working in collaboration with them. So it's a really exciting situation. These girls learn about tools, they learn about being, uh, having high self-esteem. And so um, that is what Rosie's Girls is about, making sure our young people um, are able to um, learn about what they can do within the construction industry. Next, we have our crew program, which is all about our young people, 18 to 24 year, years of age, and they are learning about the construction industry. They get to try out different tools. Uh, they get certifications through our NCCER uh, certification program. This is done with our partner YOU, Youth Opportunities Unlimited, and they are able to uh, provide training up front, the, the NCCER um, certifications, our young people then get forklift uh, certification as well as OSHA 10 certification. They actually have an opportunity to do site visits and are able to go ahead and actually work for six weeks on a job so that they actually get experience. Uh, we are working on a relationship with Cleveland Builds so that they are able then to go ahead and um, become part of the union. So that is what CREW is about. Next, we have our wonderful um, um, the Real Black Friday Flip This Business. This is kind of our HTV piece where we take an existing uh, business owner. We help to build their capacity while we're also upgrading up to $50,000 their business space. And so that's a lot of fun. We have our partners, corporate partners helping us to judge. And then there's the big reveal. So that's a lot of fun. Um, and it's getting uh, one business at a time, making them better, stronger organizationally. And then lastly, we have, of course, what you're seeing today is our Level Up program. And our Level Up program is about building capacity of small business owners, rather that's construct or medium-sized business owners, that's construction, and that's service industries that support uh, the construction industry. Uh, we have our Level Up luncheons, which you are a part of today, but we also are going to begin doing our educational uh, components where we're going to dig in. So... Um, you know, CLE will be offering our QuickBooks series so that if you need to get into QuickBooks, we have a way for you to learn about it and be able to master it. So our goal here at Level Up is to make sure that we are leveling you up, making you a stronger company, either to be a subcontractor or a better solopreneur and hopefully a bigger business. So that is what we do here at NAMAC. And um, without further ado, um, I want to say that we are so lucky to have an esteemed set of panelists here today. I'm going to turn the program over to Meltree Sharp, uh, who helped to organize this, and she's going to be our moderator for the rest of the session. Thank you, Lisa. Again, welcome to Nate Mack's second level up session, Being Bankable. We are thrilled to have you join us and look forward to a dynamic discussion. To our listening audit, audience, we are confident this discussion will be worthwhile and hope that something is said that will enable you to grow and scale your business and help you reach greater heights. 
Um, I'm excited to begin this discussion with our distinguished panelists of experts, of which I admire and respect each and every last one of them. Um, today we have, I am going to introduce you. I'm going to start with um, Mr. Wesley Gillespie, the regional president of Erie Bank, a, a subsidiary of CN Bank. Wesley is responsible for the expansion into the Cleveland market, as well as lead the growth efforts of the Northeast Ohio, I mean, Northeast region of Erie Bank. In his role as regional president, Wesley has full responsibility for starting up, managing and directing the overall market-based commercial industrial lending activities across Northeast Ohio. Wesley also has responsibility for the de delivery of commercial services, including commercial real estate, treasury management, and private banking across the region. Wesley is responsible for building the Erie Bank customer base in Northeast Ohio by building relationships and ensuring the delivery of best in class service at every level. Welcome, Wesley. Thank you. Larice Purnell, my partner, the best partner in the world, has 20 years of experience in business management, tax, finance, and marketing. He is the current co-owner and managing partner of CLE Consulting Firm, an accounting tax and pay payroll and business consulting company located in downtown Cleveland. He is a strong, innovative financial and strategic leader with both instincts and intellect a formidable combination in the business world. He has served in executive positions, leading business and financial departments with multi-million dollar for-profit and non-profit corporations. He is the author of Financial Foundations, Building Financial Freedoms One Tool at a Time, where he uses everyday language to address the most fundamental questions people have about money. If you do not have that book, I encourage you to purchase it. Um, welcome, Liz. Jay Stefan Holmes is Senior Vice President of Government Banking Sources and manage, manages public fund, fund relationships with First National Bank in the Ohio market. His clients are municipalities, school districts, regional government agencies, and area colleges and universities. He provides financing for bond and tax notes, as well as direct municipal leasing services. Welcome. Douglas Wheeler is, bank, is business banking sales leader for North East, North, Northeast Ohio of Key Bank. Doug manages a team of 14 relationship managers who work with companies whose revenue size is between three to 20 million annually. Keith Rogers grew up following the lead of his grandfather, Richard Rogers, former owner and president of Cook. In construction all of his life, Keith got his formal start 20 years ago as a warehouse runner and worked his way up through the ranks. Keith has now been a part of the ownership team as executive vice president for more than five years. The company started its growth by offering asphalt, paving services, and was able to launch into most civil construction crafts, crafts including underground utility installation, site development, and concrete paving. Cook Paving and Construction has enjoyed a very rich contracting history throughout Northeast Ohio, including being the first MBE certified company to win a prime construction contract with the Ohio Department of Transportation. That's a big deal. Paving the warning track of Jacob Field, now Progressive Field, and the building and, and building the Lake Road of sustainable expansion for Cleveland. Keith is also um, on the board of NAMAC. So we have lots to cover. So with that said, I want to jump right in. Are you guys okay with that? Yeah. Thank God I'm a woman at this, at this, at this moderating. <laughs> <laughs> um, so real quick, tell us, I, I know I introduced you guys and, and, and gave your short bios, but tell us a little more about your company, um, yourself, and why the topic of being bankable is important to you. If any of you can start. Or let's start with you, Larissa, and then just go around. A 
comments later. Thank you for that painful suggestion. It needs to be discussed. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what the other panelists have to say about this report. And again, my name is Larissa Burnell. I'm a native of Cleveland, graduate of Warrenville um, Heights. Uh, I'm, a pr I'm proud to be a Tiger. I see Gary here in the room today. I'm also a fellow Tiger. But I would say uh, also the management partner of CLE Consulting Firm, which we are partners. Uh, we're an accounting, tax, and payroll company. Um, and we are a true partner to the trusted partner. For the topic of being bankable, it is imperative. One, we talk about, about an organization that our community going from being a hobby um, to being a small business, then to become a partner. Oh, I can take it down. <laughs> I didn't know it. So, uh, but to also want to be enterprises. Yes, so when we when you talked earlier about you know we had the opportunity uh, based on access to capital to be Fortune 100, Fortune 500. Day to day, we handle a couple hundred businesses here in this community. So I tell people we don't just read about statistics. We actually get to experience it and deal with these businesses and see the challenges that they face. And we get to see, they say that the saying goes, happy grand opening, happy uh, grand closing. Um, and a lot of it is because of the lack of access to capital. So again, um, it's important that we have this conversation so we can dive into why being available and create further success within our community. Mr. West. Thank you, Beltree. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you to NAMAC for inviting me to be on the uh, panel this morning. Um, again, Wes Gillespie, I'm the Northeast Ohio president for Erie Bank. <clears throat> Erie Bank um, is a community bank, um, and you know we you know we have a roughly five five hundred and fifty employees, and you know we focus on the community. We really focus on um, all the markets that we're in being a a part of the community, a solution. We we realize we're not the only solution, but we want to be part of the solution, um, and we focus. When we go into markets, we focus on commercial, um, you know, business owners because that's really where our core competency is. And then, as we build out a market, we build all the other things: you know, the residential, the consumer. And our bank was really started uh, 150 years ago by small businesses in the community of Clearfield, Pennsylvania. And so, our roots go all the way back to really helping small businesses become successful in a community. And so that's the number one reason why we're very focused on really being a solution to our uh, the communities we serve. As an African-American man um, and lots of uh, friends and, and, and even family members that own businesses, obviously, you know, I, I have insight into the banking industry, the financial ecosystem, which really has been a barrier. And we all know that has been a barrier to um, small and minority owned businesses for many years. And so I think I can be, um, along with the organization behind me, I think it can be a real change and a real, uh, make a positive impact. So it's really, really important to me. And, and lastly, legacy building and being able to really say that I really was able through the, the, the support of the bank, be able to make a difference. Um. I echo, I echo with uh, everything that's been said before. Uh, First National Bank is, is a bank that was founded over 110 years ago out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, we have um, close to 4,000 employees, uh, 370 odd branches, 17 of which are in the Cleveland area. Um, and uh, looking around, and I know almost everyone on this panel, and all, definitely all the bankers being the, the senior member, um, you know, my, my experience has, has, has gone from uh, starting my banking career over 30 years ago as the uh, community reinvestment officer uh, to starting a, the small business loan division of, of old First Merit Bank um, to now what you read, what I do in terms of handling customers in, in the municipal um, uh, realm. What's important to me, uh, like, like Wes has said, um, being who I am uh, and, and being a, a senior person of, of, of color uh, in an industry that really doesn't have a lot of folks like me sitting there around a, a lot of the, the loan tables uh, and the decision-making tables. Um, 
I'm very conscious of connecting dots. So I try to connect dots and, 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 and gaps and hurdles, uh, not for everybody, but I have a particular sensitivity for folks that look like me, to be quite honest. So uh, I have a passion uh, to really uh, get involved with economic development in, in our area, in our region. Um, some of you might know me from, from being on the Port Authority Board. I'm also the chair of the Cleveland Citywide Development Corp, where we actually try to do things to, to rebuild neighborhoods. Um, and, and, and also, I'm the chair of Fairfax Development, because that's where my grandparents um, had me grow up in that neighborhood. So it's, it's good to give back, but it's, it's more important uh, to give back in a, in a meaningful way and trying to connect the dots because there are a lot of resources out in the community not only with the banks but the organizations like your own um, the sba is important i'll talk about that when it's my turn but um you, we need to connect the dots i mean it's it's, it's akin to and I, and I tell people all the time um when you're going to remodel your home and you go in the lows and you think you have an idea of what you want once you get to that paint aisle or that or that or that or that uh, that aisle of they have the different colors, now you're really confused. So uh, you, have, you have you have a lot of options. So what I try to do, given my experience, is bridge some of those and try to and try to have people narrow down what their visions really might be. And um, that's where my passion is, and that's where I really I get a lot of satisfaction daily if I can help somebody and connect those dots. Well, Therese, thank you for having us. And thank you for the invitation to be here. I think, A, the organization itself is something that has been needed in our community as we talk about trying to uplift the community as a whole. Um, and I think that you talk about the term bank. Well, first of all, I'm a senior vice president with Key Bank. And obviously, you know, we're the largest bank domiciled here in, in Greater Cleveland. Um, but I think that as we look at the challenges that our country faces. So much of it comes back to what you said earlier in the program about economic inequality. The city of Cleveland, unfortunately, at this point in time is ranked as one of the top three worst hmm. economic outcomes for black women in the country. And when you take a look at those numbers, you say, that's unacceptable. I'm proud to be a Clevelander and I'm proud to be a key banker that and to be a part of an organization that does so much good in this community, but there's so much more we could do. And I think where it begins is coming back to saying this whole idea that we have a zero sum game that, you know, you have to have haves and have nots in order to be successful in order for this society to work is false. I think, you know, this, this country can be very successful and that we can all have opportunities of wealth. We should make sure that everyone has opportunities of wealth. This country, this city will not survive if we don't make sure that everyone has opportunities of wealth. Truly, if you're patriotic, you believe in what this country can be, then you should do run as fast as you can towards programs that are creating economic equality. So when you talk about being bankable, that's a part of why I do what I do, to know that we can make a difference in other people's lives. Thank you, Miltrice. Thank you, Mary Mac, the team. Thank the panelists. Uh, my name's Keith Rogers, uh, owner, vice president of Cook Pavement and Construction. Uh, I own several other businesses, so, you know, I'm, I'm a busy person. Um, this, this panel and this discussion is very important to me because, uh, you know, being bankable, I mean, that's everything. I mean, it's, it's from a line of credit down to your, to your bonding. Being bankable is, is very key. And, and the end game is having financial freedom. Um, we're, in, we're in business to enjoy the freedoms and fruits of our labor. I mean, we're, we're not in business to work our tails off and fall off by the wagon. I mean, we're, we're here to leave legacies behind. Like, you know, you mentioned before, I mean, we got children behind us and we got, you know, communities that we proud to take care of. Um, so being bankable is, the key to success. Thank you so much for all of those uh, responses to that question and each of your commitment and passion around being bankable, but more importantly, helping businesses to get to that point um, in their business life. Um, we talked about this earlier, but from your perspective, from your vantage point, what are some steps that minority companies can take to become bankable? 
um, one or two of you can answer it or whoever feels the need, go ahead and answer it. Keith? As a minority company myself, um, it's not easy. Um, you mentioned your personal credit is tied to your business. I mean, that's, that's the anchor. Your, your personal is your anchor. I mean, you can, you can have a, you can, you, you can make $20 million and your credit is crap. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, you still can't get that loan. I mean, mm -hmm. It's always going to you receive a letter of no, no's, no's, no's. I mean, to say how, to how to turn those no's into yeses, I mean, you got to work on yourself. You got to take your personal life out of the business life, and you know, it be serious, serious to your business. I mean, the bookkeeping, you know, having you know proper bookkeeping in place, proper uh, personnel in place, yourself as a business owner. I mean, you got to hold yourself to the fire. Absolutely. Stefan, you want to add to that? Uh, I agree. And just like you and Mr. Todd talked about earlier, um, it all really begins, uh, especially in your first probably decade of business, it comes down to your personal credit. Yeah. It comes down to the credit of your business, but that starts again with your personal credit. And um, even though I'm in banking every day, I have to remind myself uh, to check up on my own personal credit. Mm -hmm. It's almost like checking on your uh, smoke, smoke alarms once a year, <laughs> checking those batteries. Mm -hmm. And there's something that um, I have found and others have recommended to me, uh, it's called annualcreditreport.com. <laughs> it's called annualcreditreport.com. It's free. Um, I, I wouldn't ever pay for these, to, to pay for somebody to do that for you because you can go online and do it yourself. Um, and lo and behold, last year, I, I went because I was doing a seminar at a school and I decided, well, you know what? I've been saying this. Let me just go and see what mine says. And I found two entries on my own credit report uh, that I didn't even know where they came from. Wow. Um, so that, start, that started, uh, you know, me being practicing what I preach, but I wanted to really go, you know, and I say that to everybody sincerely, uh, especially now, I mean, COVID has caused one thing, but uh, it, it, all it's really done is reinforce the issue of uh, being credit worthy uh, to when, any, when anyone does a, a credit check, which is basic for anything. You can't buy insurance without somebody, a phone, you can't buy a telephone, a cell phone without somebody running a credit report, exactly. So um, that's number one, uh, check your credit. Uh, number two, uh, and the only thing I wrote down that I want to talk about today is being intentional, uh, focused, and then follow through on that. And the, and you all have talked about, you talked about the Dunn's number. I happened to just Google SBA last night for a different reason, but it, it came up to, the, there were 10 um, suggestions that they, they gave for any company, particularly startup companies, people who are in their first decade of business. And you all have hit on all 10 of them in um, and, and your conversations. But the SBA is a, is a true um, uh, resource that all businesses, particularly minority businesses, need to take advantage of. And I can speak from a bank's perspective. If you can get approved by SBA, it, it will go far for you being accepted to the next level of approval with any bank. It mitigates our risk. Quite, quite frankly. So in short order, it, intentional focus and follow through. If they do that, check your own personal credit. There's another part that people forget and it's real free, you can download it online. It's, it's called a personal financial statement. It's just a, it's just a you know, this is, a, this is what I owe and this is what I own. And in the middle is how much I'm really worth. That's your net worth. Do that, do that annually. And again, be intentional, be focused, and then follow through on it. And you'll be surprised what can happen in a couple of years. Great advice. I love when you said, uh, check your credit, like you check the battery on your fire alarm. Really, really, really critical because if you don't do that, when you need it, it doesn't work, right? <laughs> you don't always need your fire alarm, but when you do need it, you want it to work. But if you haven't checked that battery, then it won't work when you need it. So anyone else wanted yeah. to add comments to that? Absolutely. <laughs> I yeah. figured you did. Like, you know, as a small business owner, um, I would say one thing that we have to understand that in most cases, 
Um, most African American businesses, you know, nationally are usually ran by one or two people. Um, so they're usually a jack of all trades and a master at none. If let me just say to all you watching, um, you fail to plan, so you plan to fail. Um, so putting that plan in place and also um, surrounding yourself around people that are smarter than you in areas, it's, it's like they, the saying goes, you don't hire a mechanic to do heart surgery on you, right? right? right. Um, so if I, if I could do it visually right now, I would have 10 different hats on. One would say marketer, one would say CFO, one would say business, um, you know, operations person, one would say, and the list goes on and on. So surround yourself around experienced people in areas that you know that can help you build a good foundation and us we did no trees i think one of the best moves we made as an organization we were building cle is and we have one of our advisors here in the room um arian Kirkpatrick, but we created an advisory board yeah. um so what we did was we went in the community people that we had relationships with that we felt that were experts in their particular fields and that had you know paved the way before us um, we created a, a seven person advisory yeah. committee that allowed you know, us to receive feedback, accountability. Um, so I would just encourage you, put people around you and don't try to do everything. Um, because at some point you only have so much capacity to be successful. So that's, that would be my advice from that perspective. We always tell businesses like you wouldn't look at a YouTube video and if someone extracting a tooth, you think if you watch that YouTube video, you can extract the tooth. So you have to, you know, hire smart people around you. Anyone else want to add to that question before I move on to the next one? Well, one more thing. I think, okay. You know, we, we talked about bankable. I think what's really important about being bankable, mm -hmm. banks tend to be the lowest cost provider mm -hmm. capital. Yes. Mm -hmm. So as we were talking about preparing for this, I did a Google search. And I'm going to tell you what, what happens right now, the reason you need advisors, you need accountants, mm -hmm. you need consultants, you need attorneys, is because if you did a Google search and searched, how can I be bankable as a minority contractor? The first thing that comes up is not a bank. It's <laughs> someone trying to sell you very high interest rate access to capital. See, the, the, the name of this session wasn't how to gain access to capital. It was how to be bankable. Right. Um, and, and that's important because you can find someone who will give you access to capital at 28% and ensure that your, your company will never be successful. Absolutely. All right. We see it all the time. Yes. Um, but I wanted to say, Mr. Todd said something earlier today when he talked about sweat equity. And, you know, we, we talked about a couple of things about the credit report, the annual credit report.com. But the sweat equity is an important part of it, too. Dave Ramsey once said that if you want to live like nobody else can, you have to live like nobody else is right now. <laughs> Good point. Up front, you got to like sacrifice, you have to delay some gratification. Uh, and part of that's making sure that your credit report can be where it is. And it might mean that even though you have a lot of money coming in, that you don't get to have maybe the automobile you'd like to show as a reflection of where you could be, right? Because <coughs> it's it's about free cash flow. A company needs free cash flow. Thank you. Absolutely. Good point. Absolutely. Well, Trees, can I add one last absolutely. thing? Absolutely. Absolutely, <laughs> um, you can. <laughs> and this really speaks to... Um, kind of more tactical when you're running a, a, a small business is really understand who your customer is. Know your customer. Mm -hmm. Really become obsessed with knowing who your customer is yeah. and how to serve your customer. Oftentimes I see um, business owners, uh, small business owners, minority business owners try to do too many things at once, yeah. particularly in the beginning. Yeah. You know, if you follow people like Jeff Bezos and Mark Cuban and these billionaire entrepreneurs, because they still call themselves entrepreneurs, <laughs> when they started out, they understood their market and they understood their customer. Yes. And I think that is really a critical thing for you really to be able to grow your, your, your without a customer, you have no business. Absolutely. So you better understand who your customer is, why that's your profile customer and how to serve them better than anyone else. Yeah. Don't just serve them average but serve them better than anyone else. And I think that's really critical. Yeah. But we had to learn who is our customer and who is not our customer, exactly. right? Because not knowing that can cause you to fail just as quickly. And then also you said something else that was very critical. You don't want to try to do everything. Like 
we talk about it quite fre uh, frequently within our firm is like, we're the five guys of accounting. We don't want to do be everything and be all to all people. We want to do what we do very narrowly and do really be really good at it. So thank you guys for all of that. What are some of the trends that you see currently with minority businesses and in the future of banking? Um, you want to take that, Wes? Let me uh, take a stab at it. You know, one of the things that's really happening now, and it's been accelerated with, with COVID <laughs> and the pandemic, is um, kind of electronic banking and where um, the speed to which you can get services, you gotta be careful because Doug said it best, you know, um, there are people and co companies out there that'll take advantage of you. Mm -hmm. um, but I think one of the things that are happening is I, I would tell small business owners is get comfortable with, um, you know, electronic delivery, get comfortable with virtual, get comfortable with uh, banking services electronically. And one of the trends that you, that you see is, you know, FinTech, financial technology companies um, that can provide um, services to, to business owners much faster. Mm -hmm. It's all electronic mm -hmm. and it's all, you know, how do you, uh, how do you deliver these services faster? Often, sometimes it's how do you deliver lending loans faster. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes you got to watch out for the interest rate. Paying for that quick yeah. delivery yeah. of the of the capital. And Doug mentioned earlier, it, you, that's where you have to be careful. But I see the electronic, um, elect, you know, the electronic delivery of banking services, um, something that's trending pretty rapidly. And I think it's been accelerated now. Wow, that's it. That's a great point. Larice, you want yeah. to add to that? Um, I, I want to speak um, from that. Uh, you know, accounting uh, firm perspective and also as a small business. Um, I think that what COVID did do is it exposed, yes. you know, small business owners, but it didn't just expose small business owners, mm -hmm. it's exposed service providers. But, yeah. um, so a lot of times, you know, we hear, you know, financial institutions or, you know, um, persons or companies that provide services to our small businesses say, oh, they have to pivot. Not only do they have to pivot, everybody, um, has, to everybody pivot. has to um, yes. pivot. So um, when I when we talk about statistically, the estimate is 40% of African American businesses will not make it through the pandemic. Um, so I would just challenge even companies that are out there that are providing service to minority businesses mm -hmm. to really figure out understanding the deficiencies before COVID right. and understanding now the challenges that have been, I would say, put on fire now how they pivot their resources that are being provided. Because yeah. we talked about, you know, when banks, you know, um, shut their doors, most black businesses, they didn't know who to contact. Yeah. If you heard John talk about, you had a good relationship with, you know, the branch manager or the teller, uh, what you gonna do, text them? Yeah. <laughs> They're closed. Yeah. You didn't have their personal cell phone Great number, point. so they didn't have access. Mm -hmm. So I think one, I would like to see a lot of organizations understand the importance of technical assistance. Yeah and making sure that they ensure that these minority businesses understand how to one, access them, and then understand the information that and, and resources that they have available to them at their fingertips. That's a great point. That's a, actually a great segue. Oh, did you want to add to that, yeah. Keith? Okay. No, I was just segue into the next question, but if you wanted to add to that question. For me, the importance, you know, the future of bank, I mean, you know, I mean, our cash is, just as good as anybody else's. I mean, you, you got businesses closing down. I mean, the opportunities is here. I mean, we're at, we're right here. I mean, we're right at the, at the table. I mean, we're just getting to the table, but and still got a little ways to go. But I think our money is good. And the future of banking, I, I, as you can see, the panelists, you know, you guys are banks, you're, you're out here supporting the cause. So uh, I see it extending very, very widely. All right. Wonderful. The future of banking is us. It's our cash. All cash is green. And we, we wow. it's our cash that funds the bank. That's a great point. Great point. So, Larice, you gave me a great segue into my next question, because we've, we're talking about the disparities and the challenges that um, small businesses, and particularly for this discussion, African Americans have with gaining access to capital. Um, for the financial institution, leaders in the financial institution, what are some um, opportunities that small businesses can take advantage of at your respective banks? Okay. I think, you know, every client situation is unique and different. And so I think 
you need to have a banker that you can work with that understands all the tools that are available, not only within that bank, but within the larger community. Mm -hmm. uh, something that's been of a great assistance in the state of Ohio, I mean, double the ante, they, they, they took it up a whole nother level, is a program like the Collateral Enhancement Program, mm -hmm. which gives minority, mm -hmm. certified minority business owners an opportunity to make up 80% of the collateral gap potentially on a loan without a fee in 2021. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, in some ways I have what I have as far as my tools mm -hmm. and we have certain things that we have to abide by as far as policies and procedures, but whether it be advice as far as knowing someone that can be still a, an affordable solution provider that can work in partnership with us, we're looking to bring in state of Ohio programs to supplement a solution we're trying to deliver upon. I think that's a part of what you're looking for is mm -hmm. you're looking for a banker who's equipped with knowledge yeah. and who shares it freely with customers and advisors alike. Absolutely. That's a great point, Doug, because I often say, you know, sometimes like, like Mr. Todd was saying, like, once I start making money, then all of these opportunities were open for me. But prior to that, when I'm just a startup business, when I'm just converting my hobby to a business, what are those opportunities? How do I gain access to the knowledge that will open doors for me? So you made, that was a great point. Do you want to add to that, Stefan? I, I do, Maltese, and, you, and you just hit on it. Uh, from a bank standpoint, a commercial bank, we're all structured differently. And Mr. Todd talked about it. When you first start up, you are dealing with a branch manager. Mm -hmm. uh, because that's the structure of our delivery of, of that product to the community. Mm -hmm. uh, when you expand your business, your business starts doing multi millions of dollars, employing more than two or three people, mm -hmm. you do then move into the commercial banking segment mm -hmm. of, of most banks. Mm -hmm. And they're all structured differently. You all have different points where you have that access to. Mm -hmm. But people need to at least understand. Uh, just like you talking about understanding your customer, mm -hmm. understand how the game is played mm -hmm. and how and how the banks deliver these services too. Mm -hmm. It's not that they don't want to 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 do business with you. It's their structure and and the the important part of how you can help navigate through some of that are organizations like this. Mm -hmm. You have people that have experience in dealing with it. You have you have people that have personal experiences that can remember when they were a startup a few years mm -hmm. back and what they went through. So those are the relationships and that's the value of organizations like 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 this mm -hmm. um so that, that you can offer uh, uh heartfelt and very sincere advice on how to navigate some of these uh the, these situations but being bankable and access to capital the money is there mm -hmm. the willingness i would say you see by the representatives of, of a cross-section of banks here is there right um we have all been in, in situations where um we get just as much pride as seeing a a company uh, uh, grow from a, a startup to to one that you know now is, is gets in front of senior loan committee I take pride in that it's a human thing mm -hmm. um but you you first have to know how the how how banks are structured how they deliver their products and then what we look at and that's and that's what this organization helps we've talked about it there are some basic fundamentals and you guys do it every day yeah if you don't have, from a banking standpoint, the credit, the 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 reports, your tax returns, your your financial statements, mm -hmm. things that speak for themselves, yeah. how can a banker convince other bankers to make those credit decisions to to, to loan you the money? It's 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 it's, it's darn near impossible. Okay. Yeah, because there are certain requirements and guidelines that you have to follow. So having said that, Stefan, are there any products specifically geared toward small minority owned businesses at your bank? At my bank, yes. And they're, they're delivered in a couple of different ways. Some of them are pilot projects where we target certain areas, certain industries, uh, and, they, and they vary. Uh, right now, quite honestly, we are so busy serving small businesses uh, through the PPP, PPP. process mm -hmm. uh, that has become the focus. Mm -hmm. uh, as you all probably know, uh, the Biden administration uh, just just this week uh, put a moratorium yep. on PPP processing in terms of, of of having folks that have less than ten employees go to the front of the line yep. to, to get to get those funds. So things are it's it's, it's evolving and it's and it's changing. 
Uh, somebody mentioned the word pivoting. We're constantly pivoting, and we and, and we're drilling behind our back and between our legs uh, because you know the the the, 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 the it's, we we have uh, we're we're in a whole different environment. This, this pandemic and, and pandemic and COVID has caused all of us to to not only think uh, introspectively on how we deliver, but 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 how do we deliver to our customers and who they are. So. Thank you so much. I'll just add to that, you know, our bank, Erie Bank, we're, we're a community bank. Mm -hmm. We, we, we uh, again, we, I don't think that, you know, for the most part, there's a magic product, there's a magic service. Um, Doug mentioned it, so did uh, Steph mentioned, Doug mentioned the collateral enhancement program, Steph mentioned the SBA. SBA is a really good tool that most banks can offer, including mm -hmm. Erie Bank, we offer uh, SBA loans. Um, that, you know, primarily they're for small businesses. Now, believe it or not, the government calls a small business, any company less yeah. than 500 employees. So, you know, we're all, you know, it's small business, not so small anymore. Um, but it's really making sure, and Doug said it too, is, is having a, a, a banker that can connect you, uh, Steph said it too, connect you to the right products. So at, so at Erie Bank, we also try to connect to the communities and leverage what the community has to offer. And one of the things that we're doing and we're going to be rolling out soon is, is, a, is a smaller um, business product where it's a, it looks at other things other than just your FICO score. Mm. You know, it'll look at other, you know, I don't know how the, the exact number, but many other things mm -hmm. that'll be able to get you a little more flexibility. And we pride ourselves at Erie Bank on being flexible, but it'll, it'll get you a little bit more flexibility. And that's really kind of the future what banks have to do really to try to help, you know, minority owned companies, smaller companies that when a pandemic hits, it throws everything yeah. out of whack. And so, um, so that's what we're doing and that's what we're attempting to do. But again, I kind of go back to the, you know, where we say relationship mm -hmm. to start a relationship before you need the money Absolutely. from a bank um, and, and, and banks want to do that. So um, that's what I would say about that. Yeah. Oh, that's that's good information. I do want to ask a question of Keith and Larice. Um, what are some key financial resources or partnerships to help elevate these businesses in our community as a, as business owners? What are some partnerships that you've leveraged you think are key to help elevate? Um, Urban League, of course, NAMAC, we're, we're into it now. So I would say, for yeah, you know, I, there's several, there's several opportunities out there, um, resources. I mean, I, actually, I would just say, um, you know, just be, just for, for any small business that's listening, that's out there, know, know what you're getting into. I mean, it's, it's incubators all over the city. I mean, we're, mm -hmm. we're probably stumbling over each other with all kind of information that, that, that's getting out there. Know the information what's out there. And then once you get in the door, know your banker. Yeah. I mean, have your banker on speed dial. I mean, you know, have multiple banks. Keep the bankers honest. Mm -hmm. You know, I, that's what I do all day. I play that game every day with you guys. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Larissa, mm -hmm. you want to add to that? That was good. Um, so I, I would say mm -hmm. um, just first start off because we all, everybody, I'm looking across the room and on this panel, one thing we all possess is a cell phone. Um, so we all have access to the same information. And, and I always just kind of challenge people, um, you know, as we utilize that to look up, you know, vacations, we look up that to do things that are recreational, spend that much time doing research on your industry, um, as well as access to resources that are available within your community that will help to elevate, you know, whatever uh, industry you're going into. The next thing is a couple organizations that we utilize, FCLE, you know, Mel Trees, that we send a lot of clients to that have been great partners are like the Urban League. You have um, Community Financial Center, uh, which is located right there on Shaker Boulevard. And they are free when we talk about credit. They're a free resource, a nonprofit that helps people rebuild their credit as well as, you know, create budgets. Um, you know, so it's many. You have SCORE. Um, you have the SBA you can go to to pull down a free copy um, of a business plan. So if you don't know how to create that, they have, you know, formats online for you. But there again, just research. And then, um, like Keith said, it, it goes back to that power of five that Mel Trees um, named earlier. You know, when I, I wrote that in Financial Foundations five years ago, it was because it was based on small business owners understanding that's the foundation of who you are. 
you know, now we call it the power of seven because we've added the marketing um, person as well as the HR person. But as you create relationships, ask that. Sometimes we don't ask a simple question. You're a business owner. Who do you use? Who has helped you be successful uh, within your company and, and build relationships that way? Now, all these gentlemen that are on this uh, panel, you know, are all great resources and um, of CLE. I call each and every last single one of them, mm -hmm. you know, based <laughs> on what we need to make sure that uh, we get that. So it's all about relationships as well. And as, as we come to a close, PPP is a hot topic. I have to have the bankers on the panel. One, 30 seconds, 30 seconds about how can a business owner work with you to gain access to PPP and what are the requirements? Uh, call me, you know, call, <laughs> call, call your banker, call, uh, most banks now have made it a lot more accessible than the first round. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We've learned from the first round. Mm -hmm. um, in, in most cases, it can be done through a portal or through just uploading your information to the banks. So if someone were to call me and say, hey, Wes, I'm, uh, I need a PPP, we've done hundreds and hundreds of them, I would send them out, our send them out the link so that they could access it that way. So we, we are still doing PPP loans and um, it's, it's, it, it's, it's a resource that's really helping a lot of small businesses. Um, there's a lot of small businesses that haven't even spent all the PPP money. And then we got to educate them on, you know, what not to do with the money and, and, and how to uh, treat it the correct way. So it could be forgiven the way it was meant to be. And so, yeah, just, you know, you reach out to your bank. Most banks are offering it. Um, and it, uh, it, for the most part, it's electronic and a much more uh, speedy process than prior. Wonderful. You do, you want to add something to that, Doug? Sure, I think that I would add that I would work with your accountants, work with the, your, your accounting department, whoever that is, the financial advisor, uh, and ensure that at that point in time, during the last 12 months, you had a quarter over quarter decline of 25%. Yes. Uh, and and the, the trap that some people are gonna fall in is that for loans $150,000 or less, you don't have to show that up front. Right. You only have to show that at, for, at forgiveness. But if you don't have financial records, if you're just spitballing it, we had a company we just looked at the other day who was spitballing it, but they were above 150. So we had to go ask for the financial statements. <laughs> they were 22% at the lowest period of time. Wow. So they were going to take on a $250,000 loan with a pretty short amortization period of time mm -hmm. and owe interest on it the whole time. Wow. And if you were not going to have that forgiven and you didn't spend it wisely, Could you'd you find yourself in a, in a trap. So what I'd encourage you to do is just because the requirement of the law right. states that you don't have to know what that is, you need to be talking to your, your consultants, your financial consultants, and ensuring you had that 25% drop you're going to have a nasty surprise in six to nine months. Absolutely. I definitely agree with you. We do have a question from our audience. Um, if one of you can answer it real quick as we wrap up. As a new firm with no money and no credit, what are the first steps to becoming bankable? I feel like we've already answered that question, but for someone who may have just joined, can someone just give a quick, brief 30-second, what, what do I need to do to become bankable if I'm new, I'm just starting uh, this, this business? I would start, just add one thing maybe we didn't add, uh, mention earlier is get organized. Mm. You know, it, it don't, uh, you know, don't just slap shoot it, get organized, yeah. get a team around you. And Larissa mentioned it earlier, it doesn't have to be a paid team. Oftentimes right. yeah. you can get advisors around you that can give you, that can look out for your blind spots mm -hmm. and give you advice because you gotta be organized. Um, it, it, and there's a, many ways to do that, but in your personal finances and what you're doing with the businesses, get really get organized at the very beginning. Yeah. And, and that's kind of the, to me, like one of the first steps to really, particularly if you're smaller, a smaller firm. Can you start a business with no money? I mean, I don't know. But we yeah, you know what? We, talked we didn't pay ourselves for like <laughs> well, six you, months or so. So we didn't have money. Like we would have been in yeah, you, can, you Well, you can't start a business with no money. <laughs> but, right? You can't do that. You get, There's money somewhere that's coming in. Um, educated. Yeah. Yeah. Get educated. Okay. Wonderful. Yep. 
So this was great. I can literally, this is, this is my passion. Um, I can talk, I can have this discussion all day, but on behalf of NAMAC National Association for Minority Contractors, thank you for serving as panelists. This has been deeply informational and I know I'm confident that this will be impactful to our listening audience. Um, to our listening audience, thank you for joining us today. Our panelists gave us a lot of great information. Take what you've, what you've learned today, apply it to your business and watch it grow. As Pablo Picasso said, action is the foundational key to all success. I do want to um, make a quick announcement before I turn the program over to uh, Lisa, our executive director. Um, look out for our Flip This Business with the Real Black Friday. Um, Larice is the founder and president of that organization where we'll be selecting a business in the community and we will flip it around. We will help you with your finances, your, 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 your uh, business, like, um, what? So the, the, we're gonna go all the way from the carpet to the roof. Thank you. <laughs> the so stay tuned for more details. Uh, it's gonna be very exciting. It will be all about the community, so. Absolutely. Thank you guys again for joining. Thank right. you. Thank you for having us. That was so insightful. And I, I, I think we got down to the nitty gritty where a lot of people I don't think get down quite as low level uh, in, in actually having people understand the process or as, as Steph called it, the game and how it works, right? And really understanding that. So thank you so much. Um, our next level up session will be March 25th and the topic will be leveling up, building your back office. So this was a part of that, but there are other, what did you say, the seven? Yeah, power of seven. The power of seven, we're gonna talk about that. Uh, Chris House will be our, our uh, name it board member host. Um, we'd like to thank you, our audience for joining us. Um, if you would like to sponsor one of our events, please feel free to contact me, Lisa Bottoms or Arian Kirkpatrick, our president of the board. Um, and lastly, we'd like to thank our key platinum sponsors for our fantastic event today, Key Bank and First Energy. And of course, our technology host, DigiZoom. Thank you guys again, and we hope to see you March 25th.